There are new major developments in the Justice Department's criminal investigation of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And there's new reporting that federal investigators are asking questions about former President Trump and his efforts to subvert the election. Keep in mind, until now, there's been almost no sign that investigators were looking directly at the actions of Trump himself. Now, according to the Washington Post, prosecutors have asked hours of detailed questions about meetings Trump led in December 2020 and January 2021, his pressure campaign on Pence to overturn the election, and what instructions Trump gave his lawyers and advisors about fake electors and sending electors back to the states. In addition, Justice Department investigators in April received phone records of key officials and aides in the Trump administration, including his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Meantime, the New York Times is reporting on previously undisclosed emails among Trump advisors. They were discussing their scheme of fake electors and they actually used the word fake. So there's a lot to digest here. Let's break it all down. And joining us now is Norm Eisen. He was counsel to the House Democrats during Donald Trump's first impeachment trial. He was also the Obama White House ethics czar. And Ellie Honig is the CNN senior analyst and former federal prosecutor. Guys, it's always great to have both of you, especially together. Norm, let me start with you since you're right next to me. Uh, when you take a look at all this new reporting, what does it tell you about the focus of the DOJ investigation right now? Well, Anna, uh, clearly the fake electors scheme is at the center of the web of activities that they're looking at because, come on, you can't, these are official government documents. You can't falsify or forge or counterfeit an official doc government document. It's hard it, evidence, too. It, it is. It's a smoking gun. Uh, so, and then we have these emails where even the people who are organizing it are calling them fake electors. And we have the evidence from the 1 6 committee that Donald Trump was personally involved. Uh, that uh, video, for example, from the chair of the RNC saying he asked her uh, for her help in getting the fake electors together. And now we know from the Washington Post that these kinds of questions are being asked about Trump's involvement, as well as Mike Pence. He comes into this scheme because Trump wanted Pence, apparently, to use these phony certificates to blow up the January 6th meeting of Congress and block the genuine electors. So the uh, strands of the story are starting to come together. That's what they're interested and in. And yesterday we reported how it was Pence's chief of staff, as well as another Pence aide who had testified before the DOJ. Today we're getting word that other White House officials have also been con contacted by the DOJ. But Ellie, even if the Justice Department is asking detailed questions about the former president's actions or about conversations with the former president, which the Washington Post is reporting. You say that doesn't necessarily mean Trump is a target, right? Correct, Anna. So think of it as sort of different steps in the chain here. The, the first step is, are they asking questions about you? And I think what's really interesting about the new reporting is who is going into the grand jury. The fact that it's Mark Short and Greg Jacob, they are far closer, far more insiders than anyone who we know of who Donald Trump, who, who DOJ has spoken to so far. And of course, this morning, Alyssa Farah said on New Day that other White House officials are in contact with DOJ too. That's crucial. But you start with asking questions. If the investigation progresses to a certain point, then a person can become a target, meaning somebody who prosecutors believe is reasonably likely to be charged. Then you move on to an indictment. And then, of course, the biggest challenge of all is converting an indictment into a conviction. So this is important, but it is very, very preliminary. But what would indicate then that Trump is a target? What are you watching? Yeah, so it could be a couple things. DOJ sometimes sends people target letters saying, dear Donald Trump, we now consider you to be a target. That, there's some discretion in that. DOJ doesn't always do that, but that could be something that happens. We also need to watch who else goes in to testify in the grand jury. I'm sure we'll have more reporting in the coming weeks about who that is, what types of questions they're asking, perhaps. So it's sort of a holistic evaluation. There won't necessarily be any specific moment in time other than if there's a target letter uh, between now and what might be, we don't know, but what could be an indictment. Attorney General Merrick Garland keeps getting asked about indictments. He was just asked about a possible indictment of a former president or even a candidate for president. Take a listen. We pursue justice without fear or favor. We intend to hold everyone, anyone, who was criminally responsible for the events surrounding January 6th, 
for any attempt to interfere with the lawful transfer of power from one administration to another accountable. So I hear that, and I feel like that's just become his sort of go-to response. But Norm, I know you know Garland. You've known him for some 30 years. You say you hear a level of specificity in that answer. I, I do, Anna. The lawful transfer of power. When he says he's going after anyone who interferes with the lawful transfer of power, we haven't heard those magic words before. Ellie is right. It's a mosaic of evidence. But you know, uh, another way to think of that is like a jigsaw puzzle. You know when you're putting the jigsaw puzzle and the images start to emerge? All of this evidence, including Garland using these words for the first time, suggests to me there's one person who was, we know, in charge of attempting to interfere with that lawful transfer of power. It's the person who's most responsible under our Constitution and laws for the lawful transfer of power. We've never seen a person in this office do this before in the history of the United States. That's the president of the United States, the ex-president, Donald Trump. So I think those were sharper words than we've heard before pointing at Trump. Of course, Ellie's right. We have to see where we go from here. But I think the indicators are really pointing at severe legal peril for Donald Trump. But what about timing here, Norm? Because obviously, this stuff always takes time. There's another election right around the corner. Merrick Garland seemed to indicate that there was no time frame that he was going to have to be pigeonholed to. But is there a time crunch? Well, uh, there's uh, a, a pincers movement on Donald Trump, and, and the two pincers are moving at different paces. The federal investigation, I, I feel confident we're not going to see charges, if there are any, against Trump in 2022 because of the pendency of the political season. In Georgia, though, talk about target letters. We have a prosecutor, the DA, Fonnie Willis, who's doing a parallel investigation because of the alleged wrongs in Georgia they were severe. And that prosecutor has already issued 16 target letters to fake electors. That suggests she's moving more quickly. She said she'd like to wrap up this year. We may see something faster on the state level. Let me bring this question to you, Ali, because between the DOJ investigation and that investigation in Georgia and Fulton County, who do you think is better situated legally to criminally charge a former president if that were to happen? Oh, that's a job for DOJ, in my view, both politically, practically, and legally. And let me explain why. First of all, DOJ has vastly superior resources and expertise. DOJ has over 10,000 federal prosecutors, the entire FBI and other federal law enforcement apparatus. The Fulton County DA, I, I admire the effort, but they have a grand total of about 50 attorneys. They do not specialize in complex fraud cases. But also, there's a really important legal wrinkle here. If a county DA, the Fulton County DA or any other DA, tries to indict a former president, the first move that former president will make is to go to the federal courts and say, no, 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 you cannot do that under our constitution. You can't have elected, partisan, local, county level DAs indicting people for anything that touches on the presidency. Now, I know Norm's gonna say, yeah, but that argument doesn't fly here. However, we don't know because it's never been raised. No one's ever tried to indict a former president. And beyond dispute, that's an argument that can only be made against the county level DA. It's not an argument that can be made about against DOJ. And that's why, in my view, DOJ is really uniquely situated. Only they have the institutional ballast, credibility, and I think legal standing to make this kind of case. Norm, he teed it up for you. I'll give you the final thought. Um, <laughs> Ellie, if uh, DOJ has superior resources, why is Fonnie Willis so far ahead of them, including with those 16 target letters? Uh, uh, the reason Ellie knows what I'm going to say about his legal wrinkle is because he and I have often discussed that off camera. <laughs> there is no federal immunity for a purely political attempt to interfere with an election. And you left out an important point, my friend, and Ellie is my very good friend. We consider ourselves the uh, general counsel department for Anna. Uh, it's the true. On the political front, uh, uh, prosecutor in Atlanta is much further away from Joe Biden. Merrick Garland and DOJ are in more proximity. He, after all, is the AG of Donald Trump's opponent. So there's a political advantage to moving in Georgia. She's a very determined, effective prosecutor. She's brought the cases like this before with the Atlanta teachers cheating scandal. I think she can do the job, and I think she'll do it first.